If you're feeling stressed out and you got a big frown, listen to our show and slow the fuck down. Welcome to Slow the Fuck Down Show. I'm sensuality coach Casey Hall. And I'm trauma healer Elizabeth Menzel. Season four is all about love. Each episode, we explore a different aspect of love with science, stories, skills, and songs so that you can slow down and stress less. It's important to us that every episode is worth your time and you leave feeling uplifted, inspired, and able to make positive changes in your life. And on today's episode, we're talking about slowing the fuck down with setting healthy boundaries. Yeah, so get cozy, grab your favorite beverage, and soak in our soothing support. So this is a big topic. Mega. Setting healthy boundaries does a lot. It helps build your self-esteem. It helps you with self-care. It can help you avoid burnout and even improve the relationships and quality of your life. So if you're ready to slow down, learn some badass boundary skills, and improve all of your relationships, we dedicate today's show to you. According to Dr. Carly Snyder from the New York University of Medicine, boundaries are one of the measures of relationship health. I call bad boundaries relationship killers. Ain't that the truth? (laughs) Dr. Snyder's research has consistently shown that people who have healthy relationships have better physical health, have healthier behaviors, and have a decreased risk of mortality. We're going to live forever, (laughs) according to Dr. Snyder's research. (laughs) We have awesome boundaries. Who would have thought setting healthy boundaries was the key of the fountain of youth? Yeah, we should have opened the healthy boundary school, but we we are we're teaching healthy boundaries in the love school. So we did help we did open the healthy boundary school. <laughs> and when it comes to relationships, setting healthy boundaries is crucial, but it's so much easier said than done. You can avoid setting healthy boundaries because you're afraid to speak up or maybe it's not safe to speak up. Yeah. And when you don't set healthy boundaries, you can feel trapped or become a people pleaser or get into situations where you feel taken advantage of, like other people are using you or asking too much of you, but you do it because you can't or don't set healthy boundaries. Moms, I'm talking to you. And you know, I was lucky enough to be a student of Dr. John Parakis. He's one of the psychologists, along with Dr. Lowen, who were really the founding fathers of body-mind psychotherapy, about how your mind affects your body, your body affects your mind. When I was studying with him, he said, when we don't set boundaries and we're not 100% honest with the other person, it's because we're afraid of losing love. It goes back to a survival mechanism that we all have since we were babies that, you know, a baby is cute and cuddly looking because it gets the parent to love it more and the baby is totally helpless. So that getting the parent to love it more means that the infant will survive. So losing love triggers our survival instinct. It triggers that flight, fight, freeze, faint. And so it can feel terrifying to set boundaries. It feels like we could die. And if we're in a dangerous situation, you know, if you're in an abusive household, setting boundaries could be really dangerous. So Casey and I wanted to make an episode about this because we know how hardwired we are to not set boundaries. Every single person listening to this, without a doubt, has had trouble setting healthy boundaries. And we we all do. And I think that that's really at the core of it. And boundaries can be both physical and emotional. So your physical boundaries involve what you're comfortable with regarding personal space, touch, privacy, sexual contact. There's really not a lot of healthy modeling of that. I always think if I could like go back and give some words of wisdom to my younger self, I would tell her, I'm talking to 20 some year old Casey who liked to go out and party, that just because I'm single doesn't mean that people get dibs on me. What I mean by that is because I was single, I didn't owe anybody my time, my physical space, my attention. And there was this weird dynamic that existed where when I was in partnership in my 20s and I went out and someone was like, oh, are you seeing someone? And I'll be like, yes. And then they would leave me alone. And then if I said no, there was this weird sense of obligation where I would sit there and then keep talking to somebody that I wasn't interested in for the sake of some obligation that I picked up somewhere along the line. Well, yeah, that's some internalized patriarchy bullshit, right? I think most women can relate to that. I was a super 
punky rocky girls so my boundaries were probably too hard in the other direction where guys would like saddle up next to me at the bar offer to buy me a drink and I'd be like sure you can buy me a drink and they'd buy me a drink and then I'd be like but I'm not going to talk to you and I just turn around and drink it and like ice them out hard and that's certainly one way to set the bound the hard boundary <laughs> And you know, there's such there's so many nuances of boundaries, right? And we really go into that in our love school trainings where, you know, there's the super hard boundary, which are, are appropriate sometimes. Then there's the boundary that bends. You, you can have like kind of a boundary, but it's really wishy-washy. <laughs> it doesn't really work well. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely little nuances of, of boundaries. And what I've done that I found is helpful that I will share as a healthy boundary is if you are out somewhere and you happen to be single or not, if someone says, hi, are you here with someone? Can I buy you a drink? Look at them. And from your heart, just say, no, thank you. And then switch your body language to turn away from them. I I found it's a very clear no. No, thank you. It's polite. You know, you're not being mean. You're just giving them an answer from a space that feels centered and genuinely caring. And then you move, you shift your body language so it's very clear that you're not interested. I mean, that's if you don't want them to buy you a drink. I mean, if you do want them to buy you a drink, by all means. <laughs> <laughs> But I love that you you took that breath, you slow down, take that pause, and give yourself a moment to feel into it, to assess the situation, to assess the person offering to buy you a drink. What kind of a vibe do you get off of them? You know, slow down, give yourself that time and space to discern whether or not you want to engage with that person at all. I think... As women, and I'll speak for myself, not in the buying me a drink situation, but in almost every other situation, I thought what was loving and compassionate and right was to just always say yes to what the other person wanted. And I didn't learn what Casey just shared, which was you can open your heart and still say no. You can set that boundary with open hearted love. And I've learned over the years that that is much more compassionate than what I used to do, which was set the really hard, mean boundary, or what Casey used to do, which was get caught up in a conversation with someone she didn't want to talk to. With no boundary. <laughs> Just like, oh, I'm stuck here all night. Right? You feel trapped, right? Yes, you feel trapped. That's what I was saying earlier, is that when you don't set healthy boundaries, you can feel trapped. And what is a trapped feeling? A feeling of trauma right? So not setting boundaries can be traumatizing, y'all. It can perpetuate our own painful beliefs and get us into dangerous situations or at the very least uncomfortable situations that we really wish we weren't in. Another way that I've seen this play out in my life that, again, I would tell a younger version of myself is dancing. When you go out dancing or there's a big group and everybody has their own boundaries on what they're comfortable in terms of touch. For me personally, if I don't know you, don't don't touch me. Do not touch me unless there is some type of consent. Even when you do know me, like, you know, we, we really have to be cool. I remember being on the dance floor. Slow down, listeners. I think we can all relate to the situation where you're dancing and you're watching people dance. And then you see somebody go up and start dancing with somebody else in a way that you can feel that the other person feels uncomfortable. I've seen men do this to women and women do this to men. And you can just tell by their body language that it's just like, ooh, like I'm not okay with this, but they just keep doing it anyway. That's that kind of physical boundary that I'm talking about that I've gotten much better at with uh, setting a healthy boundary around. So I was at a party last year. People were on the dance floor and there was this guy who just kept going up and touching everybody. He was like a very touchy feely dancer. And I started dancing and he comes up to me and he's like, touch, 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 touch. And I grabbed his hands and I was like, hi, you seem to be having a really fun time. Please do not touch me when we're dancing. If you would like to dance, you can dance next to me but don't touch me and he just goes oh okay and then and then just you know we proceed to have this amazing little like dance off like but we were like not touching each other and I was like oh wow that was amazingly well received <laughs> <laughs> yeah you lucked out you yeah lucked out on that one 
Another example of physical boundaries is hugging. Now, especially because of the pandemic, maybe people have gotten more out of the habit of hugging when they meet someone, but especially around, you know, super hippies and super <laughs> spiritual people, this whole like hugging the first time you're meeting someone, I'm not on board with that. I'm just not. I'm a super warm, super huggy, feely person. If I know you, if I don't know you, I do not want your arms wrapped around me. I think people have gotten better over the years and ask, hey, is it okay if I hug you? But there can be this like, I'm a hugger, and they just come in with no consent and wrap their arms around you. You're allowed to step back. You're allowed to say, oh, hey, I'm not a hugger. What else could we do here? Like, can we touch elbows? Can we, like, whatever you're comfortable with. You're allowed to do that. Just like Casey did with the handsy dancer. Don't hold me closer, handsy dancer. So we just want to give you full permission to learn your own boundaries and start getting courageous and bold with speaking them out loud to other people. And, you know, in safe situations, this fear of losing love is real. But I found that often, instead of tearing you apart, it can allow you to commune with the other person because you are actually being more honest with them. So in Casey's example of the handsy dancer, she communed with him. She looked him in the eyes. She let him know her needs, but she didn't close off her heart. So there was still a communion and a connection between them. And I'll wager that what he really wanted was connection. And you gave that to him. I love that you bring that up too, because a lot of human connection is nonverbal. And so there's some degree of him that knew that he was making people uncomfortable. And to actually have somebody call you out on that in a very loving way, I feel is an act of love. It is an act of service. And you know, there's risk in every human interaction, right? There's the risk of setting a boundary and losing love. And people also feel risk in true connection and intimacy and getting closer, right? So Casey and I totally get that boundaries can be like a double-edged sword for a lot of people because they don't want to set them too hard. They don't want to set them too soft. Like it can be a real minefield. It is a skill set. I had to be taught how to set healthy boundaries with an open heart and when to make them harder and really more strong and when to allow them to be a little more pliable and getting to a sense of inner safety there is a lot to this boundary setting business. A hundred percent. We're dynamic. And so we're always changing. Relationships are always changing. And that is why Elizabeth and I literally created a school to teach people how to do this. And it's what we do with our one-on-one -on -one clients because it is case by case. Yeah, everyone's unique. Everyone's boundaries are unique to them, their wounding, their strengths, their situation that they're in. And boundaries are dynamic. Like you said, they change. So they're going to change not just from you unique individual to unique individual, but within one person, they're going to change a lot. One of the things that I help my one-on-one -on -one clients do is to discover what their own unique sensuality looks and feels like. And once they figure that out, we discuss uh, loving and clear ways for them to share that with people that they're dating or their significant others. And you, know, you talk about people being dynamic and needs changing. What feels good for someone sexually can feel good for a season and then never again. Or something that turns them on could be a go-to turn-on that works every time. And so being able to communicate what you like, what you want, how you like to be touched is crucial in maintaining a healthy sexual relationship as well. Because it's impossible for you and the other person to read one another's mind and know what's going on. So you have to communicate and you have to tell them about the boundaries of what your yes, maybe, and no's are. Y'all, Casey's really good at helping people with sexy times. Oh, I thank you. Yeah. And I mean, listen, I've been in my relationship for 14 years and my ability to clearly speak my sexual boundaries has grown. It was really hard for me to talk about sexy stuff out loud. And my partner really wanted to talk about it, which was totally healthy and right. <laughs> I had such a hard time speaking about it. So I found a way to honor both of us, which was, okay, we can talk about sex things for five minutes. <laughs> so I found a way to have a boundary that helped me feel safe 
shorter amount of time and to honor his need to talk about sex. So then we would do these sort of little increment amount of time talks because otherwise, right, either we're not going to talk about it at all <laughs> and then that's going to create unhealthy sexual energy between us or I'm going to push my own boundary too far and talk about it for too long and that's going to make me shut down more. So like that's what we're talking about, about your boundaries being unique in the situation and then they get to change. And I mean, now, you know, we're 14 years in and I've gotten better and better at it. But negotiating those sexual boundaries is an ongoing, unfolding, ever-changing thing. It's We're always growing. If you're in a really healthy romantic relationship, it doesn't get stale because you keep growing. You keep coming up against your boundary renegotiating it and then the boundary shifts a little bit and that gives you room to grow Ooh. I love that you moved in teeny increments that felt honoring of what you were both needing in a way that feels like it caused you to be a little bit uncomfortable and challenged you just a little bit to continue to grow. But that's the key to not losing that oomph. And I love that you and Dale have that. And that's one of the reasons. Yeah. And you know, it is one of those things where my positive intention for connection and wanting to deepen my intimacy with him was the positive intention to keep the passion alive between us, the positive intention to be loving and kind to each other. We never raise our voices. That's one of our foundational promises is that we don't raise our voices at each other in meanness, in, in sexual pleasure and fun. Yes, <laughs> but never in meanness. And that's all part of creating a healthy relationship is that you have these foundational building block agreements that you honor each other's boundaries while finding ways to connect and grow. And that's a great example of an emotional boundary. Your emotional boundaries and your physical boundaries are strongly connected, but you need both. One is inner world, one is outer world. And our inner world and outer world are intertwined and constantly dynamically affect each other. That's what physics is all about. Physics is the interplay between energy, space, and matter. So in terms of emotional boundaries, one of the things that I hear a lot and I've experienced is when you're lacking emotional boundaries, it's easy to lose yourself in a relationship. Yeah, I mean, that's how I ended up on a pig farm in Belgium in the middle of the countryside. <laughs> I can't top that. We're done. But for real, that that's a perfect example because you can think back to those moments in relationships and you're like, how did I get here? You know, and it's normally never quick. It's a very subtle frog boiling in water. <laughs> It's a series of small boundary violations that you don't even realize that you're doing. But like we said in the beginning, because part of you is so afraid that you're going to lose love, you just kind of make excuses for or ignore or push aside the things that you know that you are or that you need in relationship for the sake of making it work. Exactly. That's how we find ourselves in crazy, fucked up situations like emergency moving out of your apartment in one afternoon. Like speeding down the highway, going 100 miles per hour, yelling at your significant other through the window as they drive beside you. Like taking care of the flowers, invitations, seating arrangements for your friend's wedding, but you're not the maid of honor and you're not even in the wedding party. I mean, honestly, slow down fans, we would love to hear the ways that you have violated your own boundaries and the weird situations it has gotten you into. Because when people hear about it, they feel less bad about themselves. Right. And we've all done some weird, crazy shit for the sake of not losing love. So we've talked about emotional boundaries and physical boundaries. There's also professional boundaries. Mm. And especially as someone that, that helps people with their sensuality and sexuality, Casey, you must have a lot of experience with holding professional boundaries. <laughs> Yes. So differentiating between people who are messaging me because they're interested in dating me and differentiating between people who are messaging me because they're genuinely interested in coaching. Yeah, it's tricky. 
I think any healer listening to this can relate. Like, we just want to heal everybody. We want to heal the whole world. For the first 20 years of my professional practice, I would just say yes to everybody who called me for healing. No matter what their issue was, uh, no matter what was going on, I felt this weight on my shoulders that I had to heal it. And then I just started setting healthier boundaries in my healership and having a consultation with people really honing in on if I could be 100% successful with the transformation that person wanted and only taking the clients that I knew I could guarantee that I could help them. So if you're a healer, I strongly urge you to set a professional boundary in a way that's going to help you to not burn out and to help you to feel successful by getting really clear on the transformation that you offer people. And you know, now I'm nearly 30 years into my career and I've now had another shift in my professional boundaries of I just want to help people love themselves and create fun, healthy sex relationships. And that just lights me up inside and makes me excited. They're the ones I'm welcoming in to my healing practice. And I'm just super clear about that. I think a, another big one when it comes to professional boundaries that I've learned along the way is the boundary around my time. I'm very clear with both my friends and my clients of when I am and when I am not available. And you know from the work that you do is there's always something more that could be done. There's always a, a deeper layer to go. There's always another, some other way you could add support. And I think that uh, for me, setting that boundary of time has been really crucial in maintaining a sense of sustainability. Yeah, I think as a coach, you really have to use time as your boundary. As a healer, I'm so grateful for the training I've had because we follow a healing wave so you begin the healing it builds there's this crescendo when the energy is just pouring through at a super high volume and then it starts to taper off when that person's reached their mass capacity for how much energy they can assimilate and healthily utilize right because even too much energy will then become detrimental. Too much, too soon, too fast is the definition of trauma. So um, even healing can become traumatizing if it's too much. So I ride that healing wave and, and there is a natural boundary that happens there, but you have to be really skilled to be able to feel it. I like how you bring in that uh, too much energy can also be harmful because I think a lot of times, uh, especially in the healing world, it's like more is best. Actually, in, in anything, it's more is best, but it also bleeds over into that world too. And it's thinking like, oh, but this is a really good thing. So it, it has to be really good. And no. I remember being at a retreat once and they paired us up and each person essentially held space and monitored their partner for an hour each of breath work. What? An hour? I mean, a minute. When I work with a Z-Hell functional neurobiologist, we can do a few seconds and it's enough. So uh, that infuriates me. This was before I knew much about breath work. I kind of was like just dipping my toe into that world. And all around me, I am I am hearing screams and yells and all of these like super intense reactions and some laughter. And it was just, it was like a level of energy that I've never experienced before. And I remember being with my partner and she shared with me that she had gone through a ton of trauma four or five months prior to the retreat and that's why she was there to heal and this breath work was supposed to encourage us to move through our feelings and 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 everything in me was like keep this calm encourage her to just breathe natural and not push it but she wanted to push it because the instructions were if you pushed it and if you did the breath work the whole time then you would you know eventually get to where you need to be and your body would know what to do and it's and I was just like no like that I'm sorry, I can't, I have to hold this this super um, safe, gentle space for this woman. And so I did. I remember afterwards her sharing her disappointment. She's like, I just felt so calmed and soothed by you that I wasn't able to like get like the real experience. And I apologized. I was like, I'm sorry. I know that wasn't the instructions, but I, 
I couldn't do that. Like I was feeling a no. The next day she had a different partner who followed the instructions and then for the next four days continued to do these hour long breathwork sessions and fried her nervous system. And I saw that she had done this huge post about being traumatized at that event. My schedule was completely packed with the fallout of all of these people from the breathwork workshop who had been completely traumatized. I'm looking at their chakras. They were blown out from within. If you've ever seen like a bullet hole through a sheet of metal and you know it gets that blown out quality, that's what their chakras looked like because they had been so traumatized. When you're forced to breathe that way, you are utterly dysregulating your nervous system. You are getting either too much oxygen or too much carbon dioxide. It is terrible for your brain and your harming your body. You're harming your mind. You're harming your emotions. You are harming your nervous system. It is traumatizing. Breath has been used for thousands of years in different traditions. And, and when it is done in a way that is nervous system friendly and it's gentle and it's something that the, the you know your system can actually process and work with, it can be healing. So yes to breath work, no to intense bouts of breath work that just blow you open. I am setting a boundary right here, right now. It's a, it's a boundary, it's a boundary that we're setting and hopefully some listeners will heal and it will save them that experience. Learn from other people's mistakes so you don't have to do it to yourself. So with professional boundaries, working the amount of time that works well for you, the amount of clients that works well for you, the amount of hours that works well for you, you know, that you have to be really aware of if you're an entrepreneur. And I think most people overwork, work too much, work too hard. And I think it's been a real awakening during the pandemic where people got to slow down and got to realize just how much they were pushing themselves and how much they were overdoing it. And when everyone was sheltering in place, there was this forced boundary, which yeah, it drove a lot of people crazy and was absolutely terrible and detrimental in a lot of ways. But in other ways, for some people, it really helped them and they changed the way they work. There's been a huge revolution with people changing the way they work and setting healthier work-life balance boundaries. So that was one of the silver linings to the very dark cloud of this pandemic. Even you and I have gone through a transformation. I mean, when, when we first started this podcast, how many hours a week were we spending on it? Like, 40? Is it 40? <laughs> in, in addition to still seeing right. clients. Like this <laughs> we because we were total newbies. We were just like, oh, how do what's a podcast? Yeah. But, you know, it's per perfect example is, you know, us meeting regularly and sharing our boundaries our, you know, as our needs are sh have shifted or as our time has shifted and we just keep finding new ways to organize our schedule that works for both of our personal and professional schedules. We still spend a lot of time on each episode, but <laughs> not 40 hours. Because <laughs> we love you, Slow Down fans. Right after a word from our sponsor, we're going to go into our Slow Down interview, Slow Down song, and our Slow Down skill. Hey Slowdown fans, it's me, Mother Nature. I love giving and nurturing, but when you pollute my waters, take too much of my oil, and clear cut my trees, I feel angry. In order for us to have a healthy relationship, I need more respect around my limits of what I can give. When you don't respect my boundaries, I get triggered and go to extremes. Floods, droughts, wildfires, tropical storms. We can live in harmony if you honor my boundaries. And if you don't, I'll just keep fucking up your shit. Thank you for throwing down, Mother Nature. And now for your slow down interview. Today, we are so excited to have Willie McNeil on the show. Willie McNeil is one of Los Angeles's most diversified percussionists. He's well known as the musical director and drummer from the 40 Deuce Burlesque Nightclub and his residencies at the LA nightclubs Edison, La Descarga, and No Vacancy. He plays drums, writes, sings, produces, arranges, and acts. Willie has worked with acts as diverse as the rapper Guru, John Mayall, Joe Strummer, 
and Ernest Wranglin, and since 2002 has performed annually at the Fuji Rock Festival in Japan. Willie also wrote and performed the Slow the Fuck Down Show theme song and Slow Down Skills music, and he has been my friend since 1982. Welcome to Slow the Fuck Down Show, Willie McNeil. Oh, thank you for having me, ladies. You always have so many interesting and creative things going on in your life. How do you even find the time to slow down? <laughs> well, during the pandemic, it was easy, but uh, <laughs> I'm an avid hiker. That's always helps me uh, slow down because then you get out to nature and you just kind of zone out, come back. I do my little stretch, even get a little shavasana on after my stretch. And that's how I slow down. Hiking is a great one. I know Elizabeth and I will actually walk on Fridays and we have our meetings outdoor because it, it just helps us slow down. It's just great to be in nature. And I'm fortunate. Uh, I just moved uh, recently very close to some really great hiking trails in the, the San Gabriel Mountains here in uh, Los Angeles, just uh, in, in Altadena. It's very fortunate to just two blocks away, we have a trailhead. And, you know, when we were hiking yesterday, my wife and I, we were on the trail and a deer jumped probably about 15 feet, probably had an eight foot foot, you know, height on the jump, it just jumped. It was only about 12 feet in front of us. It was running away from a dog and it was unbelievable to see this deer. It was like, wow, I haven't seen my first bear, but we'll get there. <laughs> Let's hope you don't. I saw some bear cubs once when I was hiking. I used to live in Boulder, Colorado and I um, my bestie and I were hiking there and we saw bear cubs and we were just like, cause wherever the cubs are, you know, the mama's around and super protective and we hightailed it out of there. <laughs> Yeah, bear cubs aren't a good sign. You mentioned the pandemic. Um, how how has the pandemic affected you in terms of slowing down? Oh, it definitely has uh, made me slow down more. During uh, 2020, when it really, uh, you know, the first year of it, of course, all self-employed people, musicians and artists and stuff lost all their work. You know, you can't perform in a nightclub, you can't do a tour, you can't do anything because it's all involves the public, you know, and big groups of people. So everybody I know, all the artists and dancers and everyone I know, we all lost all of our work for a good year for, uh, until they opened up clubs again. That definitely um, made me slow down a lot because all of a sudden I didn't have any music work. Uh, luckily, I, I have my real estate license and um, I was able to help my wife sell a few houses and condos. So I was able to make some money, but it definitely uh, made me slow down and uh, definitely made me hike more and get out to nature more. I was really happy and also gave us more time to, you know, to get yoga and, you know, we're we were pretty much doing yoga once or twice a week and getting about four hikes on a week. So almost exercising every day. So, and the yoga really, I don't know, I think it's almost, I love it for the body and for what it does, you know, for all, all the stretching and breathing and everything, but it's almost for the mind. It, it's almost even better in a way, the way it just makes you calm, makes it at least does for me. So the slowdown got you into more yoga, which got you feeling calmer. Exactly. Yeah. No, I really never felt bad. I lost 20 pounds and, uh, and we were drinking less. And I tell you, I probably never felt better than that period when we were doing the yoga and the exercise regularly definitely slowed down but then we bought a house and like last last year in the, a new house and i had to ramp it back up well with you ramping it back up how are you keeping in the self-care and slowness like what's it like for you now well it's easier now that this trail is just two blocks from our house so you know we can um if we just have an hour it's like we just go out and get a hike on for an hour that's how we it, we just have made it more private as the missus says, it's a lifestyle change. Definitely, we, we've made it, a, you know, a habit, a choice to, you know, get out there and do it more and also do the yoga as well. At least we're doing yoga once a week now. Dang, Louis, that's excellent. That's why you're looking so good. <laughs> that's such great slowdown wisdom because people do things once and they're like, well, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Moving your body in ways that work for you and are right for you has a cumulative effect. And it's not just going to erase 20 years of stress in one try. Correct. <laughs> like, you've got to do it regularly. It does have to become a way of life. You know, if yoga is not your thing, I personally got fired from yoga from a yogini because it was breaking my back. But everyone else I know, it's amazing for and awesome for. I love weightlifting. I love dancing. I just joined a rock climbing a uh, rock climbing gym. There you go. So like, just find a way that your body likes to exercise and move and just incorporate movement into your life. Something that's joyful and fun and healthy for you. Yeah, I totally agree. 
So Willie, what slow down advice do you have for our listeners? Well, my biggest piece of advice would be to turn off politics altogether. I haven't been watching the news and politics radio or Facebook or anything for years, particularly during the Trump era. I just turned it off completely. And believe me, by just being on social media, being on Instagram or Facebook and, or YouTube, I'm, I'm a YouTuber. You, you see all the news. I keep up. I know what's going on. You don't have to watch the news. You know what's going to happen. And so it's, I don't miss out on anything. And I, and I don't have any of the drama or any of the angst that all that stuff winds you up about. And the other thing is I practice gratitude. I practice gratitude every morning uh, if I can, if I remember. I lay in bed. I love to hear the sound of the heater. And I lay there. And I just, you know, be grateful for all the things in your life, you know, whether it's your wife, your house, your dog, your work, whatever it is. It could be a little thing. It could be like, oh, wow, I'm really glad, you know, that, you know, I'm getting to go to my friends and watch a Super Bowl tomorrow or whatever, you know. Uh, it really, I think, helps start the day and you know, help slow you down, like just to be grateful for what you have and not be tripping about the future. Well, you heard it unprompted from Willie Slowdown fans. He's backing us <laughs> up because gratitude practices are one of our favorite ways to help people slow down, open their heart and feel so much happier and healthier in their life. So thanks for the backup, Willie. <laughs> You're welcome. You got it. Anytime. <laughs> Willie, what's your what's your favorite slowdown song or music? Yeah, well, my favorite music would be Brazilian music. Uh, I really love Brazilian and Cuban music a lot. For the slowdown, I really like uh, Brazilian music. João Gilberto is one of my favorite artists. He's really great, and uh, he had there's a couple records uh, that he's on that I love. Uh, one is called uh, Amaroso, and there's a song called Estate on that. That's really Really beautiful, great string arrangement. And then uh, another one is a uh, Stan Getz album that he co-leads on called The Best of Two Worlds. And uh, a couple songs in there, but particularly this song called Linda Bahia and another one called Ligia, which are really beautiful. So I would recommend just hit up Joao Gilberto, the J-O-A-O, -O, then Gilberto, Gilberto. Uh, hit him up. Anything he does is really mellow and sexy and slow. I love him. Perfect. Mellow, sexy, and slow. That's that's speaking our language. All the way. <laughs> I play Brazilian music more than anything in this house. So, Willie, how do people find your music? Well, I have a new album out, or it's a, actually an album that I'm re-releasing digitally called Mulata Loca in, uh, in Spanish. You know, that's a, a crazy girl. And um, uh, it's uh, you can find it at avocadio.fanlink.com to slash mulata loca that's m-u-l-a-t-a-l-o-c-a we'll be sure to post that on our facebook page and at slow the f down show.com willie thank you thank you thank you so much my friend for being on our show and giving good slow down wisdom and excellent slow down songs you're welcome <laughs> and now for your slow down skills okay casey how do you feel inside your body when your boundary is violated either from yourself or from someone else how does that feel inside of you mm. i notice that my throat gets tight i feel a sense of like stuckness like i just kind of like go into a freeze response and then there's just like a faint feeling of frustration behind it Mm, got it. How about you? This is going to sound really weird, but I feel like a giant ice cream scoop has hollowed out my body. Mm -hmm. And I feel kind of lost, like I don't know what to say. My mind goes really blank. Like it's really hard to think. And I get that this feeling of dread, this total sinking feeling inside of me. And Casey, how do you feel when you're setting boundaries like a badass? I had instantly noticed when you asked that question that my posture corrected itself and I sat more upright. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I feel like I can breathe more, mm. like I have more access to my lungs. Mm -hmm. I can feel my feet on the earth, like I feel connected, like I'm grounded in. And there's still a sense of 
I want to say like anxiousness because setting a boundary isn't comfortable, but it's like uh, workable anxiousness. Like it's it's not like the anxiousness that causes me to go into freeze. It's just like a, yeah, uh, this is gonna this has the potential to be a little bit uncomfortable, but I need to do it type mm. of thing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. When I'm setting a boundary, I feel a strength. It's the opposite of the ice cream scoop feeling is I feel myself very solidly. Like I feel solid throughout my whole trunk area. If I'm sitting, I feel my butt. If I'm standing, I feel my feet on the, the ground. Like I feel solid. Often the words flow out really easily and the words come from deep within me. Like I'm noticing all the way down to my vagina this font of energy coming up and coming out of my mouth in in words that are clear now at this point in my journey of setting boundaries it's actually soothing for me and so even if i'm setting a boundary um that in the past would have made given me that sort of low level anxiety nervousness you were talking about now it just feels like this soothing act of love and i get a lot of strength from it uh, I have to say, as a sensuality coach, the fact that part of the strength of your boundary came from your vagina makes me so happy because that is a level of boundary setting fucking mastery. And I love it. <laughs> yeah, because to feel safe, you have to be strongly grounded. Something I started training myself to do decades ago was to really open my root chakra and ground down whenever I started to feel scared. And I felt scared most of the time. So, <laughs> you know, and now it's automatic. I just automatically do it. So, uh, yeah, I've come a long way, that's for sure. So Slow Down fans, we invite you to think of an area in your life where you say yes, but what you really want to be saying is no. Can you think of anywhere in your life? It could be with your child, with your partner, with a boss, right? Where you say yes, but you really want to say no. And start to get aware of what it feels like for you. Because when a boundary is violated, we can often go blank. And all we've got to rely on as a touchstone is how the sensation feels inside our body when a boundary has been violated. And a lot of times that's kind of the first inclination of like, oh, right, this is what's happening. This is my boundary being violated. So get to know what that feels like inside your system, because when you don't know what it feels like, you can't do anything about it. But once you, you know, like, ooh, I need to set a boundary here, then you can do something about it. And if you can think of a time when it was really easy for you to set a boundary and speak your needs and say no when you met no, then you can call that up inside of you, that sensation that you have when you honored yourself and you said no when you meant no. So really get to know how each one feels. That's the start. And if you want more help, with setting boundaries, we invite you to check out the love.school. That's the love.school. And you can enroll in our Love Another or Love Yourself programs, and we'll help you get masterful at setting boundaries. And you can also get support learning how to feel what setting boundaries feels like in your body the second Saturday of each month at our super slow down stress release class. Yeah, you can go to the love.school slash stress release class. And it's free for essential workers. And for our sloth and blue whale level patrons. Woo! Elizabeth, what was your favorite part of today's show? I liked remembering that John Paracas told us that we become people pleasers and don't set boundaries and don't voice our needs because we're afraid of losing love. Something about that and my love of helping people love themselves. Like it all just goes together so beautifully. Casey, what was your favorite part of today's show? I kind of enjoyed Mother Nature's saucy little segment there. 
about about boundary setting. This was a, a longer recording day for us, so I also also love uh, getting a little slap happy and giggly with you. That's <laughs> one of my favorite things. We had a lot of technical difficulties, and then clients, and then we had to eat, and <laughs> we got interrupted a lot. It was a whole thing. Slow down, fan. We want to hear what your favorite part of today's show. So please give us five stars and tell us how much you love us. On our next episode, slow the fuck down with intuition. Thank you for listening and enjoy your slowdown. If you love our show, become a patron. You'll get tons of goodies. Go to patreon.com slash slow the F down show and pick the tier that feels best to you. Thank you so much for your love and support. If you're feeling stressed out and you got a big frown, listen to our show and slow the fuck down.